It's late May now, and the fry are all in their mud ponds for the summer. Showa, Kohaku, Sanke, and also Achiba and Kujaku this year. They are out of my hands, on their own, to an extent. They're in the wild, and Mother Nature goes about her business. The dragonflies and other insects are busy laying their eggs, which will hatch and become predators. These are Showa fry, eight days old. They spend their days and nights foraging for food. Notice many are black and some are yellow. Some of the yellow Showa fry manage to sneak through the first culling, and some have already switched from black to yellow. These are Kohaku fry at 12 days old. In just a few days, the dragonfly larvae and other insects have grown large, and they'll see my fry as a food source for a few weeks until the fry grow larger and the tables turn. This one hangs in the water waiting for a fry to pass by. Since this insect attaches itself to the water surface, one method farmers use to eliminate these predators is to oil the pond surface, snuffing them out. Unfortunately, this 18-day-old Showa fry got too close and has become a meal. These insects are the first in a chain of predators my fry will have to avoid throughout their lives. This aggressive insect doesn't care that I prep the parent stock and grow out ponds for months before spawning this potential show winner, and doesn't care about all the other hours of work and expense I've poured into producing this meal he's eating. To this insect, it's a meal, for now. Later this insect will become a meal for this fry's siblings who managed to survive and grow. The days get hotter and longer and the fry continue to grow and develop. These are mosquito larvae in a grow up pond just recently filled. They're in a race with the koi fry. Can they morph into mosquitoes before the fry grow large enough to eat them? Here an insect has found a meal, and these 17-day-old Showa fry are getting excited about all the action and movement. Four of my ponds are at the lower corner of the farm, with no electrical service within reach, so all pumping and aeration chores are handled by gas-powered equipment.
These are Kujaku fry at 34 days old, enjoying the summer sun. The ground here is now crawling or hopping with baby toads. While feeding some of the larger females, I noticed something was rustling at my feet. A water snake was caught up in the bird netting. It was not happy either. Fortunately, this is not a venomous snake. Another of its methods of defense is to excrete this extremely smelly paste. <laughs> this stuff makes a great cologne, if you'd prefer to be alone for the evening. So I'm now working with a snake that bites and stinks. Notice the shape of the head right now. This water snake is non-venomous, but when provoked, it will change the shape of its head to mimic its venomous cousin, the water moccasin. The distinctive colors of the snake are a dull brown body and an orange belly. I slowly and carefully clip it out of the bird netting. Now that it's free and has calmed down a little, you can see the true shape of its head, more resembling the non-venomous snakes of North America. This snake will eat koi and other fish, but spends a lot of its time on the pond banks hunting for frogs. The skin's a little frayed, but it looks healthy overall and is ready to get away. and the fry continue to lounge in the hot North Carolina sun, growing and developing their colors and patterning. These are fry of the koi I call my New Age Showa at 40 days old. New Age meaning a modern new cross. With this koi, the fry begin clear rather than black. And within two weeks, all of the fry develop black coloring, 100% of them. In comparison, in a typical Showa group, 30 to 60 percent of the fry will be black and the rest yellow or white. We see a similar development with sankes. The summer rolls on and the fry continue to grow and develop. The moon of the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the peak of the season, Hardcore culling begins.
This is a group of my Showa fry at 46 days old. Culling is a personal event for a breeder. Here I'll see what I've produced since spawning. I'll see how the numbers look and have a glimpse of how the season looks overall. Do you see any Showas? This gives you an idea of the ratios produced. Culling is hard work. It's dirty physical labor. The day is spent covered in mud and pond critters. The afternoon is spent sorting through thousands of fry. The tadpoles that have developed legs decide to bail out and head back to the pond. The next day is Kohaku Day. Thousands of snails inch their way back to the deeper water. In a few weeks, when I do the second cull on this pond, these snails won't be here anymore. Any thoughts on why? I pull the seine net through the water, gathering up the young Kohaku fry. Another long day still ahead. I'm a little cautious in this pond. Just a week before, I saw a large snapper raise its snout to the surface so I'm careful of where I put my hands and feet. Here I'm reminded that the snapper hasn't been found yet. A crawfish finds its way to the surface. and the fascinating walking stick. This beetle bites hard and is also considered a predator to very young fry, but not fry of this size. Always plenty of bullfrogs. Nice legs. Tasty. After a couple of days of recuperation from the Kohaku culling, I move on to a pond of Sankes. Here I notice the water is moving in an odd swirl. I didn't find the snapper in the Kohaku pond. I think he's moved over here to this pond. Notice the swirl in the center of the frame and how it moves along. I think we've located him.
I need to get this thing out of the pond so I have no surprises when gathering up the sakis in here. I keep my eye on this swirling duckweed and wait for an opportunity to get a closer look. Whatever this is, is big, and it's circling back around towards me. There I can see its shell. So I move in and head it off. Yep, this is the snapper. I reach down and put my hand on the top of its shell and try to get an idea of where its head is. Hopefully I'll choose the right end and reach around and grab its tail. Aha! There it is, a big nasty one. These things are very powerful and you can see why I wanted to get this guy out of here before I finished seining. A bite from this guy is bad news. I often find koi that look like this at harvest time, likely the victims of snappers like this one. It's heavy and slippery. It tries to get away then decides to come after me. If I keep my hand firmly around its tail, I'm safely away from the mouth and somewhat in control of it. It still tries to get around and get a good bite in. Add nasty to nasty, this snapping turtle is hauling around a colony of leeches. Check out this cluster. Being a typical guy, I have to do the stick test just for kicks to see what kind of power this guy's packing. That's a fast strike. This turtle's well equipped for life in the mud. This is his rear foot. I've still got a full day ahead of me, so I make a temporary cage and will relocate this fella to a river about five miles down the road at the end of the day. <laughs> 